Hello, this is 428 Shibuya Scramble, as you can probably tell by the uh, prominent uh, display of the title there. Uh, this is a game made by Spike Chunsoft, uh, which are also the people responsible for Danganronpa and the Zero Escape series. I believe it's a similar kind of thing, a um, visual novel. Possibly with some puzzles here and there, uh, multiple endings, that kind of thing. Uh, different series, it's a lot of it's sort of live action, I believe, with uh, vi maybe video sequences. I'm not entirely sure. I guess we'll find out. And uh, I'm gonna just get straight into it with a new game. So uh, I started it a little before just to see if everything is working. Obviously I didn't get very far as you can tell by the time played there. So I'm going to just overwrite this and start from here. Uh, yes I want the guide. Stories are work of fiction, names, characters, places, incidents, or either products of the author's imagination or use fictitiously. Any resemblance to the actual person, living, dead, or events is probably untrue, and they give you far too little time to read that. Hopefully, not a sign of things to come. It's kind of be annoying if you can't read at your own pace. The visual novel game. の
So yeah, but I think this game's supposed to be a little bit weird, so there'll probably be a lot of me confused, scratching my head, not knowing what the hell is going on. Okay, Shibuya's story is yours to tell. Select a character. As you play through the game, the various mechanics will be explained. In 4 to 8, you follow the stories of multiple protagonists at once. Your decisions impact their experiences as you read the story. What does the day hold in store? Their fate is in your hands. Hopefully, you can see them all through to the end. To start, you have two characters, Shinya Kano and Aichi Endo. I apologise in advance for any uh, names I might butcher. I'll try my best. Let's begin by checking out Kano's story. Uh, oh, I can't pick him yet, so I guess I'm stuck with Kano. Just two more minutes to go. Shinya Kano noted the time again on his watch, scowling at the slow creep of the second hand. The time was 9.58am. Mm, yep. Wait. No. Oh, mm, yeah, yeah checks out. Furrows of consternation creased his forehead. He wasn't nervous, but he knew better than to expect everything to go smoothly. Keeping a level head was proving rather difficult. There was no room for failure. Lives were on the line here. He eyed his surroundings. Was the perp really going to show up? When? Where would he be coming from? This is, you're assuming it's a he. How would he make his approach? The Shibuya scramble was as packed as ever. A throng of people crossing this way and that, blissfully unaware. Of the dozens of detectives hidden in its mist, Alright, another minute and a half. Kano glanced down at his watch yet again. A mere 30 seconds had passed. Detective Kano had been with the enforcement arm of Shibuya's criminal affairs section for a year now, but he'd never been part of an operation this big before. He eyed the young woman standing beside the statue up ahead. She was small enough to get lost in the crowd, and she carried a nondescript attaché case. Itomi Azawa, age 19. The attaché case in her hands contained a full 50 million yen in cash. Yesterday, her twin sister Maria Ria, had been kidnapped. This was the ransom payment. The culprit had called Hitomi last night at home, referring to her by name and telling her to wait by the statue of Eshiko in Shibuya. It was almost time, but nothing. Kano was staring fixedly at the second hand on his watch when a homeless man sitting on the sidewalk murmured just loud enough for him to hear. Come on Kano, quit looking at your watch so much. What if a kidnapper sees you? Keno tried to look nonchalant as he lifted his eyes, but the scruffy character continued. You're too nervous. Just relax already. You're the one acting suspicious, Sasayama. Keno frowned. Why would some homeless guy be talking to me? Yuji Sasayama was the senior officer of the Shibuya Precinct's Criminal Affairs Division, five years older than Keno. Some words and phrases in the text appear in blue. These are called tips. Press square to underline a tip and then press X. 
This will let you read some extra info relating to that word or phrase. There are tips containing general knowledge and ones that are 428 specific. These are marked with a magnifying glass and a 428 logo respectively. Shibuya Precinct. Official name Shibuya, Shibuya Central Precinct. Responsible for the safety of approximately 200,000 people in 32 neighborhoods, including um, including all of these, which you can read at your own pace. I'll give you a second. I am not yet about to try that. <clears throat> okay, are we done? Yep, all of those. Okay. He always went a little overboard with the disguises. He claimed it was all a part of the job, but word around the station was that he just liked playing dress up. Nothing wrong with that. Hey pal, spare some change. Sasayama lurched to his feet and shuffled close to Kano. Hey, knock that off. Fitting leave for the part, Sasayama reeked pretty badly. Well, he's just suspicious now, huh? clanked Kano with mock camaraderie, despite the younger man's attempt to pull away. Come on, Sasayama, cut it out. Sasayama's blithe confidence rattled Kano's nerves. Of course, there was good reason for that confidence. This was Kano and Sasayama's jurisdiction, but they were positioned a good distance from where the handoff was to take place. A particular region over which an organisation or a member thereof has control or authority it refers here to the areas under the jurisdiction of various police precincts. The Metropolitan Police Department at the pinnacle of Tokyo's police hierarchy has vastly more authority than local precincts. But since many officers wind up needing to work with both, the outright rivalry between the two isn't as notable as TV dramas may make it seem. The statue of Hachiko was surrounded by elite investigators from one of the HQ special investigation teams. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes two or more tips will appear on a single screen. Press square repeatedly to change which words are underlined. Highlight the tip you wish to read and then press X. Continue pressing X or press circle to return to reading the story. Let's have a look at the statue of Hachiko. Bronze statue of a dog erected in 1934. The dog was famous for loyally waiting for his absent master. Well known as a meetup spot outside of Shibuya Station. Other popular meetup spots at the station are the display car for the original Tokyo 5000 series, commonly known as the Green Frog, and the Moyai statue by the west entrance. So have a look at the HQ. Here refers to the Metropolitan Police Department, the Tokyo Police section responsible for managing 101 precincts within the city, Japan's largest police organisation. In addition to police in Tokyo, it has various other duties and authorities for maintaining public order in the capital. Kano and his partner were just there to provide backup if the kidnapper attempted to flee. Look, just try to relax, we'll be fine. Jesayama gave him a wink. A moment later, the radio squawked in Kano's ear. Alright everyone, it's time. Keep your eyes open. The voice coming through the earpiece was Koji Kuze, HQ's Operations Director. Okay, Operations Director. The individual responsible for directing the investigation in the event of a serious crime. If a task force is set up, the Operations Director is the one who assumes command. TV dramas and other fictional accounts often feature some young prodigy from the MPD as operations director, but in reality the position usually goes to a proven veteran. <clears throat> Until last year he had been the Shibuya Precinct's head detective and Kano's supervisor. We don't know when the perp is going to make contact. Don't let your guard down. Kuze's low gravelly voice echoed in Kano's ear. You don't sound too worried, Kuze. 
Kano winced at Sasayama's words. How could the man be so nonchalant? The appointed time had come and gone. Something should be happening. Whap. Kano smacked himself in the thigh to release a little tension. Okay. This sound was louder than he intended, though the suit hid his muscular physique. It did little to dampen the noise. Oh dear, show us your muscular physique, Kano. He needed to stay focused. He might be called into action at any moment. The department handled abduction cases according to a certain standard investigation procedure. Was it an attempt to extort money or, or was the motive something personal? The answer to that question determined how they'd deal with the criminal. Based on the investigation team's initial findings this time around, they probably weren't dealing with a professional kidnapper. Still, in all likelihood, it was someone with quite a long rap sheet. Probably someone who knew the family, but so far they had few leads on who might bear such a grudge. If the situation is so unclear, the plan was to apprehend whoever came to make the handoff on site. If the culprit ran with the money, there'd be no guarantee of the hostage's well-being. Hmm, still nothing. Cheshire and muttered. There he is! He's here! Kuze broke in, his voice spiking into an excited chirp. Okay, let's see what excited chirp is. Kuze's particular vocal quirk. Whenever he gets overly flustered, excited or panicked, he slips into a childish register, prone to babbling and pitching his voice. Okay, I'm sure that's relevant. <clears throat> Subject is a young male in his 20s. Wearing a bandana and an orange hoodie. Kuze, normally calm and stoic, was now squawking like an excited child. It only happened when he got particularly worked up. Kano and Shashiyama stilled themselves. He's just giving out leaflets, bro. They could see the subject now. Twenty-something male nonchalantly approached Hitomi to talk to her. He might be trying his luck. Never know. All right, people, be ready to grab this guy. Kuze was stationed in the mobile command centre not far from the intersection. Keeping tabs on the situation via video surveillance from the camera team. The young man started speaking enthusiastically to Hitomi. Man, she's, she's not interested, just, just give up. The detective watched, uncertain. Was this really the kidnapper? Mm. Okay, so there's our first choice, it seems. Your encounter selections like these join the story. These choices will change the lives of other people in addition to changing your own fate. Use the D-pad. By the way, this has no map support in this game, which is bizarre, but anyway. So I'm using a PS4 controller. Use the D-pad up and down to make your choice, then press X. The current choice will not impact you or any of the other protagonists. Okay, so I'm a bothering. <clears throat> so we've got that has that's gotta be him. Kano took a step forward and hesitated. The situation still wasn't entirely clear, he needed to get a better look at things. I'm going with B, because when this guy's just shooting his shot and not getting anywhere. <clears throat> the situation still wasn't entirely clear. He needed to get a better look at things. The newcomer held a bundle of letter-sized paper, which he showed to Hitomi as he went on talking. He tried to hand her one of the papers, but she pointedly ignored him. Undeterred, the man kept trying to foist it off on her. Dude, seriously. No means no, yeah? Hitomi refused to respond, becoming as motionless as the statue of Hachiko behind her until finally the man gave up and walked away. <sighs> Guess it wasn't him. Kano felt the tension of the moment linger in his spine. The guy must have been hitting on her, Sasayama muttered. Really? Gonna figure out what hitting on her means, apparently. 
Succeeding at meeting someone on the fly like this takes a special knack. Looks are also important. Sometimes, of course, the person trying to get your attention out of nowhere is just trying to make a sales pitch for a product or nearby establishment. At first glance, it isn't always easy to tell the difference. Thank you, game. <clears throat> I mean, she is pretty cute and all. The other point, though, of course, something in Shashirama's voice made Kano brace himself. She's got nothing on my Mi-chan. Okay. Mi-chan was Sasayama's wife that got married just last month. <laughs> Let me tell you, Kano, married life is the best. You gotta hurry up and give it a try for yourself. This was Sasayama's favourite topic lately and Kano was getting more and more fed up with it. Sasayama, come on, just knock it off, okay? The phrase had become a common refrain of his since the department partnered them. Fine, fine. Let's talk about your girlfriend then. Huh? Now you can't be serious. So say I'm a leading close again. What's she like? We're not having this conversation. Kano muttered, looking away. Oh, come on. Sashirama set his hand on Kano's chest, still playing the homeless troublemaker. Show me your phone. Let me see what you let me see your lock screen. Huh? Sashirama poured for the phone. You got a pick on your of your girl on your lock screen, yeah? I I do not. But he did. It was scary how on the mark Sashirama's instincts were. Hey, cut it out. We're in the middle of an investigation. I am investigating. Sashayama chuckled as he plucked the phone from Kano's pocket. His face scrunched up with astonishment as he looked at the lock screen. The heck is this? It's... it's not... In this... Masami Nagahama? Okay. I know that is. A national star tends to play the heroine on national morning soap operas or in the national historical dramas. Her songs have been a series of national hits and she's even slated to host the year-end national singing competition program. Everything about her is national. Apparently so. <coughs> Kenna realised he had to bite the bullet. No, that's my girlfriend. Her name is Rumi and she's... Sasayama cut him off. You're telling me this ain't Misami Nagayama, the famous actress? Because this right here is Misami Nagayama. Like I said, you sly old dog. Trying to make like you were dating Misami Nagayama. I'm not. I mean, I guess Rumi does kind of look like her. Sasharama looked at her, let out a huff. For real? Really think I'm gonna fall for that? There's nothing to fall for, all, I swear. Sasharama scowled, unconvinced. Alright, then why don't you marry her? Keno stammered, but he had no answer. The truth was, he would have happily married her already. But there were obstacles that needed to be overcome. Okay, playtime's over. Let's focus on the job. Sasayama handed back Kano's phone and turned his gaze back to Hitomi. Kano let out a quick, uneasy sigh, but his shoulders did feel looser. Maybe Sasayama had been trying to relieve a bit of the tension. Maybe he should be grateful. By now, several minutes have passed since the guy with the papers had gone away. He peered at Hitomi, the strain on her face was visible. In addition to the weight of the attaché case itself, the 5,000 10,000 yen bills it held weighed close, close to 6 kilos. Wow. Her slender arms must have been getting tired. 
Still, she refused to set the case down. She wasn't taking any chances with her sister's life. The kidnapping case had begun the day before around 7pm. This is MPD Dispatch. The Shibuya Payson is reporting a missing person believed to be an abduction. What is abduction? In Japanese law, the act of indirectly luring or deceiving someone into the control of a third party is known as kidnapping. Using forcible threats or violence to achieve the same result is known as abduction. Okay. Subject is Maria Osawa, a... name sounds familiar. A 19-year-old student at Midorima, Midoriyama Academy. Last seen at the LL Diner, Diner near campus. A man was allegedly seen forcing her into a car nearby. All officers in the vicinity reported the scene at once. Kano and Sasayama had been working a burglary case in that place's 5th district when they got the call. The two arrived at the LL Diner at 7.15pm. Roughly the same time, several other officers showed up to secure the area, blocking off entry to nearby roadways and monitoring the surrounding establishments. Inside the restaurant, Kano and Sasayama were met by the girl who had reported the kidnapping. It was the victim's twin sister, Hitomi. Would you tell us about when Maria was taken, starting from the very beginning? Kano said, keeping his voice low. I, my sister and I were supposed to go to a party together today. Tomi was trembling, her voice hoarse. But I messed up the time. I showed up right at seven an hour later than I was supposed to. So Maria had gone along to a, gone alone to a party, a mixer for locals and exchange students. Tomi, arriving late, had showed up just in time to glance out through the restaurant window and see her sister getting shoved into a car. She described the vehicle as a blue station wagon of Japanese make. Why? Why would something like this happen to her? Tomi held back the tears, but she was shaking all over. Did you get a look at the kidnapper? Yes, it was a man. Okay. Middle-aged. <coughs> Excuse me. There was another eyewitness, Leland Palmer. He identified himself as a lecturer at Hitomi and Maria's school. Suspicious. Ah, I saw too. It's like Hitomi says. I heard Hitomi cry out and so I uh, went to the window to look and... His Japanese was halting as if he hadn't been in the country very long. And I think that maybe the kidnapper was working alone? Dean explained it, seeing the man shove Maria into the back seat, then clamber into the driver's seat. If he had been if he had an accomplice, wouldn't they have been driving? Neither Hitomi nor Leland had, get a look, had gotten a look at the suspect's face. Kenner was interviewing others who had been on the scene looking for other potential witnesses when his phone rang. It was Yushu Kajiwara, one of the senior detectives. We have set up a task force for the investigation. Get back to the station once you have got a handle on the situation there. Barely half an hour had passed between the time the kidnapping was reported and the time the task force began, began the operation. Task force. Roughly 150 people were working on the case in the Shibuya Precinct's conference room. The main force at work is HQ's first special investigations unit. Additionally, other detective sections, the riot squad and investigators from the neighboring precincts have been assembled. When Kano and Sasuyama got back to the precinct station, Kuze had already arrived from HQ. He informed them that a response team had been formed to investigate the victim's home. 
In a case where someone has been abducted for ransom, it is often difficult to resolve the situation without cooperating with the victim's family, but the family can also be a hindrance in making an arrest. To help guide the family's actions, a response team is assembled and stationed at the victim's home, led by an investigator with the proper training. <clears throat> Kano could feel a particular tension in the air. Unfamiliar MPD detectives scurry to and fro around the Shibuya offices. He pulled one of them aside to get a quick update. An hour had now passed since the kidnapping. There had been a new development. The perpetrator had made a threatening call to the victim's home. He said the following. Tomorrow, 10am by Hachiko in Shibuya. Have the sister Hitomi bring 50 million yen. If not, the girl's life is forfeit. Kajiwara from the precinct was put on the response team along with the detectives from elsewhere who'd received special training in abduction cases. Normally, a local precinct detective wouldn't have gone over undercover in a victim's home. Kuze, however, decided that having a knowledgeable local was crucial and had sent Kajiwara along. The detectives disguised themselves as delivery people and movers to make their way inside without arousing suspicion. Arriving there at 8.30. The response team had come prepared to run a trace if the kidnapper had contacted the family a second time. The act of pinpointing the source of an incoming phone call. The police are not allowed to do this independently without oversight. They must go through a formalised process that includes securing the cooperation of the phone company. In the past, conducting the trace itself would take time, but nowadays acquiring the location can be practically instantaneous. <clears throat> but there were no further calls. Kano checked his watch again. 20 minutes had now passed since the time designated for the ransom handoff. The kidnapper had yet to appear. Crap, you think we might have spooked him? He wondered aloud. Hey, stay calm. Sasuyama so scanned a passing throng. He's just playing with us. Why did this guy even pick this place? Kind of voiced the question he'd been asking himself ever since he heard the kidnapper's demands. Sasuyama so shrugged. Figure he must want to blend in with the crowd, nab the money and disappear before anyone knows he's there. Would be my guess. In that case, why not pick Shinjuku or Ginza? The big crowd didn't just benefit a kidnapper after all. It also allowed the police to use a sea of people to conceal their own operation. Right now, there were 50 detectives stationed within a 50 metre radius of where Hitomi stood. The kidnapper would be taking a major risk if his plan was to nab the ransom money and run. That's what bothered Kano. Any criminal with half a brain would know better than to do a handoff in front of Hachiko. You're overthinking things, pal, Sasuyama grumbled. No, I'm not. Kano reached into his pocket and pulled out his notepad. There is a notepad. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to be careful reading this. This was Kano's dick diary, which he also always kept close at hand. It's quite veiny. Sasayama rolled his eyes. That thing again. Kano ignored him, flipping through the notepad pages. Jesus. Aha! Here it is. <laughs> Good God. Dick Dictum, number 89. The more relevant something seems, the more relevant it's bound to be. It was a favourite saying of Kuz... Kyuzo Tatano, an assistant inspector from the Shibuya precinct. Tatano was the kind of detective Kano aspired to be. For the current operation, he had been placed in charge of Hitomi's personal safety. He was in position to defend her as soon as the ransom had been handed off. Of course, Hitomi hadn't been informed of how much protection she was under. 
There was a risk that if she acted too secure, it might alert the kidnapper. I think Tateno has the right idea. To say almost snorted quietly. Maybe, I mean, he's a great detective. Don't get me wrong. But do you know how many irrelevant things there are to consider? Again, Kano ignored him. It didn't matter if nobody else understood. Kano had faith in Tatano as both a detective and as an individual. He had first witnessed Tateno's brilliance during the standoff at a financial company three years earlier. <coughs> a man had shut himself in an office, splashing gasoline everywhere and threatening to set the place ablaze. While the others hesitated, Tateno unflinchingly doused himself with gasoline and strode himself in, strode into the building, where he managed to talk the man down and secure the scene. Okay. Yeah, that would probably be in my face as well. The others had been awestruck by Tateno's actions. And Kano, who at the time had been content to be a run-of-the-mill policeman, had found it quite inspiring. Still, you know... Sasiyama murmured under his breath. As great a detective as Tadino is, it's not like anyone else in the world has ever heard of him. I suppose not, Kenu said. So? Only time anyone ever hears a cop's name is if he's caught up in some scandal or killed in the line of duty. I mean, doesn't really seem fair, does it? Kenu just shrugged. It was a strange definition of unfair, really. I mean, you've got celebrity chefs and celebrity hairdressers and stuff. So how come no celebrity gumshoes, you know? Look, please. Can you just focus on what we're doing here? Kano rubbed his eyes and turned his attention back to Hitomi. What's the matter? Didn't sleep? Not enough, I guess. Did you eat? Didn't have time. Between bringing in supplies for the base of operations, readying the team's vehicles. The base of operations usually set up in a large room at the precinct, such as an auditorium. MPD and precinct investigators assemble there, and communications equipment, investigation resources and such are brought in. Because of the scale and scope of these activities, newspaper reporters can be liable to notice. And so, in cases such as kidnapping where a victim's personal safety is at stake, the flow of information is tightly controlled. <clears throat> uh, reading teams' vehicles, uh, photocopying hundreds of documents and various other tasks. Kano had barely slept the previous night and hadn't got a meal in either. What have you been doing? So see, I'm a puffed out his chest. Saving up my energy for today. So you were sleeping? Kano gave a right chuckle at his partner's lack of shame. There he is! Kuzi's voice chirped suddenly through Kano's earpiece. A man in his twenties wearing a sleeveless red jacket is carrying a garbage bag. Okay. The young man had emerged from the crowd about 15 feet from where Hitomi was standing. He strode towards her, a sinister look on his face. It didn't match Hitomi's description, but Kano felt a jolt of nerves all the same. Maybe the kidnapper had hired some young street punk to snatch the ransom payment. That uh, guy? What do you think, Kano? Sasayama whispered. Yeah, I think he's gotta be. This was it. Kano swallowed a lump in his throat. He bent his knees, ready to act fast. Blood rushed to his leg muscles, banishing the stiffness that had begun to take hold. Could this be the culprit? Or perhaps... The young man tried to snatch the briefcase from Atomi, but she clung to it with desperate strength. It was him! The detectives rushed in. What? Hey, what the hell? 
The young man cried out frantically and tried to dart away, but the officers closed in, forcing him bodily to the ground. Target secured. Oh jeez, I think we've got another suspect on the scene. Ah, he's taking the ransom. I am not eking for anyone. <clears throat> Kuse's hysterics made Keno spin around. Sure enough, a foreign looking man was sprinting away, attaché case in his hand. A mob of detectives scrambled to pursue. Before Keno could react, most of them had run off, leaving him to look after the original suspect. What should I do with this guy, sir? He might have some connection to the kidnapper. Should I bring him in? Huh? Oh, sure, that'd be swell. I'm on it. With the help of one of the remaining detectives, Kano brought the suspect back to the Shibuya precinct. Look, how many times do we have to go through this? Cut the crap! The interrogation room, the young man who gave his name in as Aichi Endo, steadfastly insisted on his innocence. <clears throat> Why'd you try to steal that case? Kano watched as Aichi, uh, Aichi's face intently. Like I said, it looked heavy, so I was trying to help her out. It wasn't inconceivable that a young guy would want to help a pretty girl, but Hitomi had just been standing there, hardly in desperate need of assistance. She hadn't set the case down, so I figured there had to be something important inside. An entry from Kano's dick diary shot through his mind. Dick dictum number 25. When the tongue slips, grab it and yank out the truth. Classic advice for a questioning. Something important you say, such as... How the heck would I know? H.E. spat. He huffed and slumped back into his chair. The standard textbook back and forth had been going on for nearly an hour. Kano didn't mind, chasing down criminals was all well and good, but questioning suspects was another key part of the job. Plenty of off-the-scene work went into cracking a case. Once again he had Aishi explain what he'd been doing, starting from the beginning. When Kano finally emerged from the interrogation room for a short break, he learned that there had been some progress in the case of the crime scene. What the police hadn't been able to determine yet, however, was whether or not Maria was safe. Fighting back his anxiety, Kano consulted his dick diary. Dick dictum 54. Haste makes waste. He felt his tension subside. Remembering the right maxim always helped. It was like casting a magic spell. Kano returned to confront Aichi once more. You were there to act as a distraction, to mess up the investigation, weren't you? Huh? And she looked a bit dumbfounded. What are you on about? Dick Dictum number 55. The truth hungers to be free. You hungry? Got some katsudon if you like. Katsudon is... A Japanese dish consisting of a bowl of white rice topped with breaded pork cutlet and egg. There are several variations, such as sauce katsudon, where the egg is replaced with Worcester sauce, and miso katsudon, where the pork is stewed in miso. Not typically the type of thing a policeman offers a suspect during the interrogation, this could be seen as baiting with food, and is to be avoided. Eichi nodded silently. That does look good. And I'm hungry. Ichi devoured the bowl of katsudon with a gusto. He looked like he hadn't eaten in a while. Alright then, spill it. What's this guy after? Ichi just shrugged. I don't know. He murmured a thick slice of egg laden pork between his teeth. How many accomplices do you have? Kano asked. But Ichi just shook his head as he inhaled his food. Resignedly, Kano flipped through his notebook once more. Let's see, number 115. 
use the lights to your advantage. As the minutes ticked past, he found himself referring to this book again and again, trying a dozen different methods to tease out whatever his suspect might be hiding. The experience began to feel strangely surreal, the two voices echoing hollowly, hollowly in the interrogation room. Eventually, Kano looked at the clock and realised that the questioning had been going on for nearly five hours. He still hadn't made any headway. What was he supposed to do next? Tatano would know, but he sure didn't. Still, he was determined to do whatever he could to keep the victim and her family safe. Bringing his teeth in frustration, he perused the dick diary like it was scripture. Number 116. The monotonous questioning was clearly tiring Aichi out. His eyelids drooped like they were beginning to get heavy. Number 117. Get them when they're tired. Kano's eyes gleamed. You're part of some criminal gang, huh? Aichi's <laughs> head slumped forward heavily. Nodding off was basically the same as nodding yes, right? Um, I don't think so. It's Kuze, I did it. The young guy we grabbed at the handoff site. He finally confessed to the crap. No, he didn't. What? What are you talking about? Kuze laughed in disbelief. We're just about to apprehend a mastermind here. Huh? Kenno clutched his cell phone dumbstruck. Listen, why don't you, uh... Look, just wait there at the HQ, yeah? Okay? No. It can't be. I... I... After the kidnapping case wrapped up, Kano tendered his resignation. Wow. A bit of a... Bit of a jump, okay. Guess I'm not cut out to be a detective after all, he thought to himself. He dropped the dick diary on his desk as he left the Shibuya page present for the last time. Nice going, Kano. Bad end, what? Kano wound up at a bad end, however this does not mean that the choice you made for Kano was the wrong one. I didn't... Uh, what choice? Okay. One of the other protagonists, Aichi Endo, has an impact on Kano's fate here. You can avoid a bad end by making proper decisions in another character's story. For a detailed hint, check the tip by underlying the bad end title. Press square and then X. Okay. Okay, no, number one bad end in so long Shibuya. Kano had every reason to suspect Eiji Endo, but arresting him turned out to be a mistake. If Eiji hadn't approached Hitomi, this wouldn't have happened. Try playing Ichi's story up to 10.30 and make a choice that keeps him from going up to her. If you do that, Kano won't even have a chance to arrest him and things should play out differently. Interesting, yes. Select Eiji Endo, one of the other protagonists. Let's follow Eiji's story for a little while. Okay, so I guess uh, we move on to this guy next time. Um, for now, though, I'm gonna rest my voice and grab a drink, and we'll be back for the next video with Eiji. Uh, Probably pronouncing that entirely wrong. But until then, uh, I'll catch you guys next time.